welcome to our June 6th meeting, meeting of Toledo Rotary. And for those of you, uh, especially military vets, uh, today is the 78th anniversary of D-Day. And if you've ever had a chance to go and, and sit on the beaches of Normandy, it's a very moving experience. And uh, when you go to the, the American cemetery there and see all the graves, it's, uh, it's really something. So I hope you could all uh, honor all of our veterans, all the allies that uh, went ashore that day. If you have any cell phones, if, if you do, check them. Make sure the ringer is off. And we're going to move right along. Um, whoever's in the food line, just keep on going. Get to your seats when you can. Uh, Matt Adkins, please come on up and deliver a reflection. And Adam Cassie, if you would come on up and start to pledge for us after that. Good morning. In eight... In 1847, more than a decade before the start of the Civil War, the English immigrant Oliver Chase invented the first candy machine, American candy machine. Many may not be aware that candy has been an important part of war fighting since the Civil War. Original Necco wafer and other candies gained a huge boost in popularity when they became part of shipments for soldiers in the Union Army after the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861. Candies were ideal for the Army because they are small, easy to transport, tough, and do not degrade like other foods. And the fact that the candy has a sweet taste was thought to give the troops a little psychological boost during battle. World War II served as another powerful driver in the consumption of candy as they re-entered the battle with troops. The U.S. government actually commissioned Necco to produce them for soldiers fighting around the world, bringing Necco wafers to thousands of people outside the United States. In 2018, Spangler Candy of Bryan, Ohio purchased the Necco brand to ensure that the soldiers and citizens of the world would continue to have some of the best candy in the world. As we made preparations this past Friday for our weekend of leisure and possibly a weekend at a Lake Erie or Maumee State Park Beach, others were making preparations for packing up some of that candy as they prepared for another type of beach trip. As some of us climbed onto our boats to relax on the Maumee River, Others were climbing into ships to cross the English Channel. And as we enjoy our freedom today, others were hurtling themselves onto beaches with names like Utah and Omaha. It was the largest amphibious invasion in the history of warfare. On June 6, 1944, more than 150,000 brave young soldiers from the United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada stormed the beaches of Normandy, France, in a bold strategy to push the Nazis out of Western Europe and turn the tide of the war for good. By daybreak, 18,000 British and American parachutists were already on the ground. An additional 13,000 aircraft were mobilized to provide air cover and support for the invasion. At 6.30 a.m., American troops came ashore at Utah and Omaha beaches. By day's end, 155,000 Allied troops Americans, British, and Canadians had successfully stormed Normandy's beaches and were then able to push inland. Within three months, the northern part of France would be freed and the invasion force would be preparing to enter Germany, where they would meet up with Soviet forces moving in from the east. Allied casualties have been estimated as being between four and 5,000 men. German casualties on D-Day, meanwhile, have been estimated to be between 4,000 and 9,000 killed, wounded, or missing. The Allies also captured some 200,000 German prisoners of war. Let us pray as we reflect upon the sacrifices of our brave men and women 77 years ago. Dear Lord, we thank you for our brave men and women who serve us now and served us then. We thank you and them that we live in a country where we can meet every Monday as Rotarians, regardless of our political views and religious beliefs, and work together for the good of our community, our nation, and the world. Lord, we thank you for our brave soldiers who defend us, our brave first responders who protect and serve, and the creativity and ingenuity displayed by our business leaders as they develop products and services to serve us. And we pray that one day all mankind will live together in peace. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, 
one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Adam. And uh, Matt and I didn't really get together on his reflection, so good job, Matt. I would also like to thank uh, Donna Bogan and Bogan, Hartman Bogan Financial Planning for being our monthly sponsor, June. I know I saw Donna somewhere. There she is in the back. Thank you so much, Donna. Now, I know we have some uh, visiting Rotarians and or guests, so uh, if you could come to the floor mic and introduce your guests, please. It's up hiding by the column here. President Bob, I have my pleasure to introduce Alex Agurkin, who's city president of Fifth Third Bank here in town. Welcome, Alex. Good morning. It is my pleasure to introduce Corey, who's an account executive at iHeartMedia. Thank you. Welcome, Corey. <laughs> Hello, President Bob. Uh, it's my, my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Quintero, the new community outreach coordinator for Bitwise Industries. Uh, she's in charge of recruiting our students. Thank you. Welcome, Elizabeth. Okay, this is going to be tight for me. Jump. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. Uh, President Bob and Rotaria, Nina Corda with Women of Toledo. Today I have a privilege to introduce two of my guests, our United States uh, Department Professional Fellow, international from European countries. With me, I do have Nora Kish uh, from Budapest, Hungary, who is a Chief of Mayor for Budapest District 2. And I also have Gertara Hasala from Albania, who is a labor leader in her country. Thank you. Welcome, ladies. Okay, thank you. And next, if I could have past president Tom Backoff please come up and give us an announcement on the Erie Situation movie, because that's coming right up. You want to come up here, or are you good there? That's a little too tall for me. <laughs> Murph might be able to get up there, but I can't. Thanks, President Bob. This is... Uh, the final reminder uh, that this Sunday, June the 12th, uh, the documentary that the Toledo Rotary Club Foundation helped to fund will be shown at the Maumee Indoor Theater. The doors will open at 4.30 on Sunday. The documentary will be shown at 5.30. There is a reservation that must be made in advance if you go to the spoke. Last week spoke on page six. There's a link that you will fill out. Uh, the admission is free. They will ask for a donation. And uh, that we're expecting about 150, 200 people on Sunday. Uh, should be a great crowd. And uh, we're going to show the trailer again so you can see what, uh, what's up and coming. Lake Erie is the canary in the coal mine for the Great Lakes. The whole lake is green. Everywhere you look, as far as the eye can see, the water's green. I stopped coming out here because it seemed like every time I was out here, I would get respiratory problems. You sit on your boat for 20 minutes and your eyes will start to burn. And, and the smell, I, don't, I can't even describe the smell. The city started sucking it into their water intake and the bad water was already at the plant. The ratepayers of Northwest Ohio have had to reach into their pocket for the half a billion dollars needed to turn this into world-class drinking water. When they say they don't know the answer, they know. But we do not know what happens in the long term to your body, to your liver, to your kidneys. Well, let's not even talk about the land. What's your responsibility to your neighbor? Everybody's our neighbor. There is no mystery anymore as to who is causing this problem. Till I see somebody do something, I'm on the bandwagon to get it fixed. This lake is never going to recover.
Hey, doors open at 4.30, screening at 5.30. Hope to see you there. Thanks, Tom. It'd be great if we could fill the place, so get your reservations in. Um, it should be pretty interesting seeing the whole feature. Next, if I could get Murph to, or first Roy Cherry, I'm sorry. Get up here, Roy, and bring your guest, and he's going to talk about working better together, and he's got a candidate with him. Um, good afternoon, Rotarians, and thank you, President Bob. Uh, with me today is Braxton Tekel, um, and he is looking for employment. Um, he is a graduate of Liberty Center High School, where he finished 11th out of 102 students, um, and also um, had um, several other awards through, through high school. He's had some experience uh, working at Triple Diamond Plastics as a press operator over the last number of years and also did some summer maintenance uh, program at his school where he maintained um, the, the fields and, and did a lot of other maintenance projects there. He also has an associate degree in project management and is working on his bachelor degree. So um, I believe Braxton is pretty much up for anything. Um, so if anybody has any um, jobs or employment for opportunities for him, that would be great. I have uh, several copies of his resume. I know Jackie's got copies of a resume. So feel free to reach out to us at any time and uh, we can get you connected with him. And this is all part of the Working Better Together initiative, in case I did not bring that up uh, to start. And if you're not familiar with that, it is the Disability Services Committee project uh, where uh, the Epilepsy Center, um, Goodwill, and a uh, lot of industries um, have gotten together to, and the Ability Center have gotten together to um, help people uh, with disabilities get, get employment. Um, so every month, first Monday of the month, uh, one of us gets up here and talks about it and hopefully brings a, a good candidate. So I know Braxton's uh, excited to uh, get back in the workforce. So thank you very much. Good luck, Braxton. Hopefully you'll get a job here soon. And now it's time for Murph to come up and give us a foundation campaign update. I just have a couple of notes. <laughs> Time's up. <laughs> really, all I want to say is thank you to everyone who has contributed to the foundation. We are so close to helping many 501c3s meet their obligations for next year. However, we do have 25 days left. Your $5 donation becomes 10 so anyone who has a little bit of extra cash, please uh, get it to us so that we can uh, blow the lid off from the bank. Um, I will be here one more time to give you the final results of this campaign, which I'm sure you're going to be astounded at. It's awesome. We're doing really well, but we need a finish. So... Um, Anything, any extra change you have, give it to us and I'll save these notes for next time. Thank you. Thanks, Murph. So he's right. You got 25 days to get your donation in, so let's do it. Um, you probably wondered, you saw me in my t-shirt today. Um, it's a pretty important t-shirt to me and it's, uh, I was, most of you probably know what the honor flight is when the veterans are taken to Washington, D.C. and at no cost to them, it's a day trip, get a tour of the monuments and uh, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and all that kind of stuff. And I had the good fortune in 2018 to be a guardian. And it was a very emotional trip. I took a, a man named Jack McDermott, uh, a Korean War vet, um, he was from Lima, and we have since lost Jack, and I was amazed how much that affected me when I only really spent a day with a man 
and how it affected me for him to pass. Um, I hope I hope that, uh, and one of the main reasons, not only being D-Day, but as of tomorrow morning, they start up the honor flight again. So I will be out at Toledo Express helping out at 5.30 a.m. Uh, they actually leave from the main terminal this time at about 8 o'clock. And that's pretty flexible because if you have tried to load and unload some 80 or 90 year old men and women uh, all at once, it's, it takes at least an hour and a half to load or unload a plane. And we're also, uh, normally they would go out of Grand Air, the private terminal and TSA would come over. Well, TSA wouldn't do that this year. And so they've got to move them from Grand Air to the main terminal. And they just told them that last week and to the rescue came Judy Potter, Rotarian Judy Potter, and black and white transport, and they are providing buses to move them from Grand Air breakfast down to the main terminal. So a shout out to Judy, who is also a vet. So anyway, that's why I'm wearing this t-shirt. Um, I'm too old to get another one, so. But it was, it was well worth my trip. Um, next. We're going to get on with our speaker. So, Zach Isaac, please come on up and introduce Kirk. Thanks, President Bob. We, I think we missed one table in the back, Susan and Tom, with the goodies. So just steal some before you leave. Um, being from Bryan, Ohio, gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Kirk Vashaw. He's the fourth generation Spangler. Uh, that is now CEO of the company. Uh, Kurt grew up in Olney, Maryland, got his engineering degree from Cornell. Uh, from there, he worked for a huge construction management company called Gilbane Building Company, uh, primarily in the East. After that, he went to the Ross School of Business, got his MBA at Michigan. Um, in 2003, he returned to uh, Spangler Candy Company. And in 2008, Kurt became the seventh president of Spangler Candy's 114-year history is the first fourth generation family member to lead the company. Um, I have the pleasure of being on their board of directors, so I've seen Kurt work for the last four or five years, and it's amazing the team that Spangler's has assembled. And I can tell you from the days that I was playing hide and seek in the factory back in the 60s, uh, the automation is unbelievable what they've done. And he's gonna share, I guess, what they've done. Uh, the recent two acquisitions were a bit of honey and Neckel wafers. But with all that, uh, Kurt Bashaw. Thank you so much for the invitation today. It's always a good excuse to get out of the office. Make sure I got set up here. So I didn't know where to start. You know, the, the company's 116 years old, and I've got about 25 minutes. So uh, <laughs> th thought I'd do a little bit of history and then get into some of the more uh, recent things that we've, we've done with the, the business. But just as an overview, uh, as Zach said, we're a private family-held business owned by the Spangler family, uh, fourth generation. That's what uh, I, I am. 840,000-square-foot uh, facility in Bryan, Ohio. We have about 500 employees in Bryan, and nearly 100 have worked there more than 25 years. So we've got a lot of candy-making experience. We also have a co-manufacturing facility in Mexico that has about 300 people, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And we are the 12th largest candy company in the United States. That's where we are today. Going back, uh, it was founded by Arthur Spangler. He's the guy there in the middle. He bought uh, the Gold Leaf Baking Powder Company, which went bankrupt in Defiance, Ohio in 1906. Uh, he uh, got it at auction. I think the price was $400. He immediately moved it to Bryan, Ohio and he started with his two brothers. And they ran the company um, from 1906 until basically the World War II period. And they were very, very, um, they, they were, especially Arthur was just an entrepreneur. 
they just tried making stuff and seeing if it sold, and some of it did and some of it didn't. And I would say probably 99.9% .9 of all the products that Spangler Candy has done over the years have failed. But that 0.1%, that's, you just got to find some of those. But these guys were not afraid to fail, and they would uh, try things and fail, fail quickly. Now, I always, uh, I used to ask, who do you think that I'm related to? So one of these guys is my great-grandfather. And I would give people hints. I'd say, hey, it's, it's the good looking one. That's the one I'm related to. And we had a high school group in, and uh, a girl raised her hand. She says, I can't tell which is the good looking one. So I. <laughs> but for the record, uh, Omar is my great grandfather, the, uh, the guy there on the, on the left. So this is the, uh, the second generation. Now, so the guy in the, the middle there, and see in the front, that's Ernest of the first generation. By the time you got to. Uh, Arthur, Omar died, I think, in 1940, and Arthur died in 1944. And there was a time where Ernest was the only one at the, the company because all six of the men on the outside, and they were all cousins, they all went to World War II in different are arenas around the world. And there Ernest was back at the factory. His brothers had died by himself, not knowing if any of them would ever come back. And, you know, we, we've all personally had uh, tough days and tough business issues, and I would never trade any of the bad times that I've had as, uh, you know, CEO or president with the uncertainty that Ernest had back then. But the good news is everybody did come back, and the second generation took over in 1946. They incorporated the company. Uh, it's a C-Corp, which it still is today, and they ran it as a committee. They didn't do anything unless they all agreed. Now, apparently, of course, I didn't know them. I, I knew my grandfather, who's the guy there on the, the lower right. But uh, they all had different personalities. And the fact that the company was able to achieve anything was uh, a miracle to, to some. But they did a couple great things. Uh, they did a lot of great things. But uh, they bought Dum Dums in 1952. And they bought the A to Z Candy Company in Detroit in the mid-50s. Those two. Uh, acquisitions are still alive and well today, and I'll talk more about them. So these guys, they had a mandatory retirement age, age 65. So enter the third generation of management from 1976 to 2011. And notice the group is now a little bit smaller. One of the things that you might hear in family businesses is that the first generation founds it, the second generation grows it, and the third generation screws it up. And the second generation was kind of aware of the, the, the dangers of transitioning to the third generation. So what they did in the early 70s, before they retired, they did what we, I called professionalize the companies. So they brought in outside board of directors. They required a financial audit. I mean, we're a private company. We don't need to get financially audited, but we still do every year. And they made a rule that if you're a family member, if you're going to work for the company, you have to work somewhere else first. Because business has, I know a lot of people in here are business people, it's, it's tough, it's competitive. So you need to have the best people and the right people and the right uh, stage of the bus. So that, that uh, caused some amount of angst in, in the company, but it did, uh, it did work and we had a successful uh, third generation. Fourth generation, just quickly there, 2011 is when I officially became the CEO. Of the people in that picture, that's our management committee, there's two of us who are family members, and everybody else is not, but I would call them family. You're looking at over 250 years of candy making experience at Spangler Candy in that, that picture. And so the people um, that are not technically family members, they do have shares of the company that they've earned uh, over the years as part of their employment compensation, and they're very much vested as well, and they, they, I consider them family. Now. Again, we have about 500 employees in the company. Only five of us are actually family members. And so people ask, hey, what's the secret of a family business? And I say, get the family out. <laughs> so just a little bit about the confectionery industry itself, uh, just to kind of, kind of give you a sense of where we fit into it. Uh, in the United States, it's divided in the confectionery market is there's non-chocolate and there's chocolate. So the total market together, non-chocolate and chocolate, is $39 billion. The non-chocolate segment, which is this pie graph up here, is $17 billion. And about half of the non-chocolate segment are what we call the big three. So Hershey, Mars Wrigley, 
Nestle, it's not Nestle anymore, it's actually Ferrar, but you would know them as the Nestle brands. They're about half the business. And then the other half is hundreds of candy companies. Hundreds, lots of, lots of little ones, many, many family businesses. Spangler is 1.6%, so that little sliver there at the, the top, I don't know if you can see that, but very top, that's, uh, that's Spangler, Spangler Candy. So it's a very robust, competitive industry, and it's a, it's a fun industry. I think most people know Dum Dums is our flagship brand. It's maybe roughly half of our, our sales total. Uh, it's the number one lollipop in the United States. We make 12 million every day, Monday through Friday, year-round, about 2.6 billion a year. It's, it's impressive that we make that, that many, and, and it is. Uh, I think it's more impressive that we sell that many. <laughs> but they're produced in uh, the world's largest lollipop factory is in Bryan, Ohio. It's our factory, uh, and we've, we've had that, uh, that confirmed. You've probably seen our products uh, around. These are just some of the different flavors we make. We make well over 50 flavors. Most bags have 16 flavors at the same, uh, same time. We even sell by color. So a lot of people do crafting. This is kind of a new business segment we got into about five years ago. And you'll find these in the craft section of your, your stores where you're actually not buying candy, but you're buying so much. You're buying, uh, buying it by color to decorate. We're a world leader in candy canes. We are the only major producer in the United States. All those products you see there, we make and sell. We might license the brand from another company, but we are a major player in uh, the candy cane market. Candy canes are produced year round. Every day of the year we make them, but they're only sold in November and December. So we have a really, really big warehouse. And it's very working capital intensive, but it's, uh, it's a tricky business, but it's the one that we're in and we're, we're good at it. Uh, candy canes are the number one non-chocolate item in December. Does anyone know what the number one chocolate item is in December? Any guesses? Hershey Kisses, yep, exactly. Uh, and candy canes are a bit unique uh, in that they function both as a candy and a decoration. So half of the candy canes bought are never consumed, used on a tree. And we don't care, you know, as long as you buy them, it doesn't matter what you, <laughs> what you do to them. So we have some smaller product lines, too. We have Circus Peanuts, which I have. There's some bags out there on the, the tables. That's a very, um, you either love Circus Peanuts or you hate Circus Peanuts. There's really not anyone in the middle. But there are people out there that, that love them. That's a kind of a niche product for us we've been making for, uh, I think, since the 60s. And Safety Pops is a small uh, line that we have. So these are less than 10% of our sales, but there are in our product portfolio. I won't talk about this too much. This, these are the basic beliefs. This kind of frames our company culture. And it, th these are beliefs that our founders had, the first generation. So be honest, practical, market-wise, and independent. And I, I won't go through all those, but I will touch on the independence because this is very, very important to us. So we're independent, we're proud of it. In order to be independent, you must make an adequate profit. This is, I mean, profits are the food of a business. If you're not making profits, you're not growing, or you're borrowing from somebody else. And the first generation, for whatever reason, they didn't love banks. And I actually don't know why, but it, turned, it was great. In the Great Depression, when all the banks failed, they didn't have their money in the banks. They had it in candy inventory. But uh, not that we're opposed to taking on some debt, but we don't want to take on too much. We're taking a long-term view of things. We're thinking about the next generation, not the next year. And we take risks, but we don't bet the farm. This is particularly important for a family business. And it's uh, because we can't, our, our, we, what we want to do is survive to the next generation. And uh, there's a lot of businesses that's not the goal. And if you think about in 1906, there were uh, you know, the Dow Jones Industrials. Did you know none? That's not true. There's only one of the Dow Jones Industrial Companies in 1906 that's still in existence today. That's General Electric. Their goal was not to survive. Their goal was to create shareholder value, and if they sold off or broke up, or you know, that was that was okay. And that's true of a lot of different companies. For us, we have to. Uh, we don't want to do anything that will sacrifice the uh, the business. We don't want to make too big of a bet. So I mention that because. It kind of frames the way that we thought about our business in the past 10 years. So in 2010, we had discussions 
with the NECO company in Boston about acquiring NECO wafers and sweethearts. Long story short, they, they want, you know, we wanted, said we'll pay X and they wanted Y and we said, hey, you know, we're going to have to take on too much debt. This is too big of a risk. We're bet betting the farm if we do this. So we couldn't come to terms and we just walked away. In 2018, something similar with Pearson's Candy in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, we wanted, we were interested in bit of honey, couldn't get there on valuation. We just kind of parted ways. And ne so NECA wafers and sweethearts and bit of honey, they're all strategic fits for our company. Uh, they're, in, they're in the non-chocolate category. They're relatively small, but they're all national brands, which was important for us, and they matched our distribution base. So uh, Matt talked about NECA wafers. So, uh, but yes, yeah, the first mass-produced candy, 1847. Like he said, it's very, very much a part of the national fabric. I mean, the, especially soldiers and, and people that their parents were GIs, it's a very meaningful candy to them, I think maybe for obvious reasons. The, uh, it's also one of the few candies today that you can get, if you like clove as a flavor, it has clove. So they're, they're on your, uh, welcome to take all the candy that's on your, your table today. They're also, they do very well at Christmas. They're the best kind of shingle you can have on your gingerbread house. <laughs> Don't go for the gumballs, that's the cheap stuff. Get your kids and grandkids the best shingles out there. Uh, Sweethearts uh, is created in 1902, so actually a little older than Spangler. And it's, of course, the iconic Valentine Day candy. And it fit well with us. You know, we, we are very strong. Dum Dums is one of the top Halloween items. Candy canes, I just told you, are a top Christmas item. And now you have uh, Sweethearts and Conversation Hearts as a top Valentine's item. So in the summer of 2018, really eight years after we started talking with them, NECA went bankrupt. And we bought all the equipment. We auctioned off all the pieces we didn't want. I can't tell you the exact cost, but I can say it was worth the wait. <laughs> uh, we moved NECA wafers and sweethearts to Mexico. I'll, I'll talk about why that was in a minute. It was 67 trucks of equipment. It was just this monster move. Oh, we pulled some of the equipment out through the roof, and that, there's a picture of that there. And the brands were out of the market until 2020 as we outfitted the existing Mexican plant. So since we're, so it got us up to like 2018. March of 2020 rolls around, and we're working on NECO, and COVID hits. And so there's a question of how did Dum Dums fare during COVID? So this picture that you see, this 500 count Dum Dums, you would buy, see this at Costco or, or Sam's. Who, who buys this type of item? These are banks, teachers, uh, dry cleaners, beauty salons, parades. This item didn't do too well during COVID. And I'm gonna show you a graph here. I, I know you can't see the, the details, but the red line is the weekly sales. Uh, the right side is the beginning of March of 2020, right as COVID hit. The left side extends to the, the summer of 2020, and you can see this was a pretty big hit. And we were, so the 75% drop, that's where it bottomed out. That was the last week in March of 2020. You know, we're seeing this, we're just, I'm just shocked, right? Like, who would have expected this? And we said, well, I guess at least it can't go below zero. But then we heard, like, oil was at negative $36 a barrel. So, like, maybe it can. Maybe people will start returning their dum-dums. But this is a big issue, right? Because the company had never, only in one year did the company lose money. And that was in the Great Depression. They lost $1,000. Uh, and we pride ourselves on, you know, not having to need outside assistance, and here you're looking at this, and I'm like, oh my gosh, we're going to, any of you who run a plant know that you cannot run a plant on 25% capacity, like it's just your hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging money. So this was a real, like, hey, what are we going to do? And of course, we decided, you know, we're not going to cut 75% of our staff. I mean, that'd be like amputating our, our legs to get through this. And, and we had, we had cash reserves, so I wasn't really worried about going bankrupt, but this was a problem that we needed to fix. So what, what did we do? Well, we had some tools in our tool chest to get out of this hole. The first thing was NECO wafers. 
And we decided to launch that in May of 2020. So jump back to when that was. That was in shutdown world. And we said, let's, let's launch it. And our sales team was like, oh my, you got to be kidding. These retailers, they just want toilet paper right now. Like they, you know, <laughs> they're not adding new items. They don't have people. This is the worst. A pandemic is the worst time to launch a product. And then we all kind of giggled because like, well, who knows? If, you know, none of us have lived through a pandemic. So we don't really know if that's true or not. So we did it. What did we have to lose? Wouldn't you know, so we just put out a press release and we pushed this a little bit. This got picked up. The launch of Necco Wafers, this little teeny candy, got picked up by 800 media outlets. I mean, it was incredible. People were locked at home and with COVID and they just wanted to go back to normal, right? And this was a nostalgic brand and they just loved it. We sold more NECO wafers in a year than NECO ever did in the 170 years before we bought them. <laughs> and I'll say that like, I only have records going 10 years back, so I don't really know if that's true, but I do know in recent memory that that was true and that we, we sold a lot more. So that, that worked out. That was good. And then we had uh, Sweethearts. And we had done Sweethearts the year before COVID just on a in some channels, because we didn't have the production up, but we did a more national launch for Valentine 2021, and kind of same thing happened. We got a lot of, uh, not quite as much media attention as the, the NECA wafers, but, but some, and so that was, that was successful. Then we launched Starburst Pops, which are, some of them are on your, your table. We launched those in July of 2021, and we had signed a licensing deal with Mars Wrigley back in August of 2020. And I'm particularly proud of our team because this went from an idea to in production in seven months. And we had to buy equipment. And it was on retailer shelves in 10 months. Normally, something like that would take two years. But we, we weren't making dum-dums, so we had to do something with our, our time. So that's what, that's what we did. We also uh, licensed some candy cane uh, brands. So Starburst, we turned into candy cane Skittles. This was a wildly successful candy cane item last year. Did some Lifesaver candy canes. We did Lifesaver lollipops at Easter, very successful. And then while we're doing all this, we also ended up acquiring Bit of Honey uh, from Pearson's in November of 2020. And we're in the process right now of that's about 40 jobs that we are moving to Bryan, Ohio from uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And that that's, will, process will just start to take place next month and it will continue over the course of the next six months. It's kind of a phased, a phased move. So I have to ask the, maybe the question you're thinking, why are NECA wafers and sweethearts, why do they go to Mexico? But Bit of Honey is coming to Bryan, Ohio. And the reason is in the, the ingredients themselves. So NECA wafers and sweethearts are nearly 100% sugar. Not quite, but like 98%. Uh, and sugar is very expensive in the United States. The expensive ingredients in bit of honey are almonds and, and honey. And those are just as expensive here as they are in Canada or, or Mexico. Why is it more expensive? Well, the... I, Especially with this group, I just felt it important. You, I think you should know this because this is a government policy which hurts Northwest Ohio and really anywhere that has a lot of manufacturing. But the, the United States Sugar Program, it's, uh, the U.S. government dictates how much nine sugar companies, and I think that's the right number, but I might, it's, it's about a dozen sugar companies, can sell each year and it limits the imports. And what this does, it raises the cost of U.S. sugar to roughly double the price of worldwide sugar. So for example, the sugar that you can get in Windsor, Ontario, which I mean, it's almost, what is it? You can almost see Windsor from here. Th this is not my quote, but I saw it in an editorial and I liked it. It's the only Soviet style market left in the United States. And what it is, it's effectively colluding to fix prices and keep them high. And, you know, I don't know, I'm not a lawyer, but I know that price fixing is illegal in most, if not all, other industries. You can't do it. You can't collude to set, limit the production to keep price higher. You just, you go to jail for that. But not, not in this market. This, it's, it's legal. The program costs uh, U.S. consumers $3.5 billion a year. 
that source is the Congressional Budget Office. There's other sources out there that are even higher than that. But according to our own governments, $3.5 billion a year. For a family of four, that's $50. So everybody's looking for, like, how do we get inflation down? Well, I got $50 for a family right there. It's over 123 U.S. manufacturing jobs lost since 2000. And I think 300 of them are right there in Bryan, Ohio, in our plant. And those of you in manufacturing or just know this probably from the, the, uh, being in this area, one manufacturing job creates about 10 other jobs up and down the supply chain, right? From truckers to um, all, all the other components that we use in our, our production. The cost of each job saved is $827,000. Again, this is per the Department of Commerce. I always thought a good compromise would be, well, let's, if you do lose your job, we'll give you $100,000 and we'll call it a day and we'll save, you know, the, the difference. But uh, the sugar program is part of the farm bill to be authorized next year. So I thought you all should, should know about it. Um, I know it's not a Republican issue or a Democratic issue. Um, it tends to, it's just, it's just a special interest group, the sugar lobby that gets people to, to vote for it. Um, Mrs. Kaptur, who I believe is, is um, your representative here, with the de redistricting, she's now, well, that will be in the same district in Bryan, Ohio as, as Toledo. So uh, when I get a chance to meet Mrs. Kaptur when she's campaigning, I want to make sure she knows about this, this issue because this hurts not only Bryan, Ohio, but it hurts, I think, everybody in Ohio because there's no, there's no sugar farmers in Ohio. There's no sugar processors in Ohio. There's really no reason to vote for this unless you are really have a sugar uh, growing region, and uh, it's so it's it's something that we struggle with. It's we do not want to be in Mexico. We don't need to be in Mexico, but we need fair sugar pricing, and hopefully it gets changed. We do have the space in Bryan, Ohio, to expand, and we're looking forward to doing that. So, moving on to just wrap up here, we had a store museum that we had to close because of COVID. And it was a little bit small anyway. So we're moving it to the downtown square in Bryan. It'll be a store museum. We'll have virtual uh, theater tours. If any of you have ever been to our store museum, we'll also have more interactive things for kids. And invite you down. Uh, th there's a picture of our square. It's a great place to visit now. We did a Chris Kindle market, which was this little Christmas market last year at Christmas time. It was super successful. Lots of people came down and I'm just really excited we're going to do that again this year. There's restaurants and theaters downtown and then we'll have our store museum. So I welcome you all uh, to come visit us anytime, but particularly around Christmas time. I think it's a great, great way to uh, spend the night with the family and, uh, and, and lots to do and worth the hour long drive to Bryan, Ohio. So with that, I will say thank you very much and uh, entertain any, any questions you guys have. Please go to the floor, Mike. Oh, someone's got to have a question. Yeah. My first question is that is it because of obesity epidemic that they ban this and they keep it banned? I, I'm sorry. Just, it's, no, it's, no it's, in U.S. we have an uh, epidemic of obesity. Is that the reason that the sugar sales are limited? No. Um, no, because the, the sugar program has been, uh, it's been in place, I think, since uh, the, the 1930s. So 1930s. it's been a long time coming. But to that point on the... Uh, the obesity ep epidemic, I think, and also diabetes. There is, uh, the candy industry is very aware that there is, just in society, people are getting too much sugar in their diets. Um, but it's not because of candy. I mean, candy makes up like 2% of the added sugars that people have in their diet. So I mean, people use candy for a treat. And the celebrations and some of the pictures I, I showed you. Uh, where Americans are getting their excess sugar is in processed foods. It's in obviously the uh, soft drinks, but also like Starbucks. I mean, I shouldn't pick on Starbucks, but uh, 
coffee drinks that are loaded up with sugar. I mean, it's like that's having that's like having a Coca Cola or a soft drink. Uh, even things like grape juice for kids, like it has a lot a lot of of sugar in it. So, if we're going to attack the obesity epidemic, I, I wouldn't do it through. Raising the price of sugar, it obviously hasn't worked, right? Um, so I think there's other ways to, um, to to do it and just to be mindful. And I, I think also that it, our, you'll, you'll notice on our bags, we put the calorie count right on it. So people know that candy has sugar in it, right? This is not a surprise. I think where um, we need to be a little bit more transparent as a, as a nation and as, as a food industry is making sure that you know, it isn't things like salad dressing and a lot of other things that you wouldn't think that that sugar is in. Yeah. My second comment is, because you look lean and trim, how many times a day do you eat candy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, you know, in the factory, you know, how many times a day you test it? Uncle Ted told me, do not eat the profits. <laughs> so. great presentation and a great company northwest ohio um without divulging any secrets um who are some of your bigger distributors customers and what do do directly or indirectly do much online business and what how much of your product is sold u.s versus domestically so um I think this question is backwards. Most of our uh, most of our sales are domestic. We do a little bit international with canes, um, but I would say probably ninety eight percent domestic. Uh, in terms of uh, e commerce, so e commerce is obviously growing very quickly, and it's a question of how you define e commerce. We have, uh, if you go to SpanglerCandy.com, you can buy any of these candies from us direct and we'll ship it out to you. But you can also buy it on Amazon. You can also go to Walmart.com and order it. And, uh, but I think in total, it's about 10% of our business. Somebody is making the purchase decision online. That could be I'm going to order it and then go pick it up in the store. Like that does count as, as e-commerce, but it's certainly been growing. And, um, but I think it's probably in that 10% range. But again, difficult to actually understand it exactly. We know how much obviously we sell directly on, on Amazon in, in our, our website. And then the, the last question that you asked was, oh, distribution. So we're in about half of our distribution we do through a broker. Um, and then the other half we do direct with the customer. So your big customers, I'm not telling anything that anyone couldn't figure out, but Walmart, Target, uh, Sam's Club, Costco, uh, Kroger, CVS, Walgreens, those, those types of what we would call food, drug, and, and mass are our big, uh, big customers. We don't do as much with specialty customers uh, just because our, you know, we're kind of a high volume operation. So hopefully that answered that question. Uh, you're knowledgeable on the sugar. Can you uh, understand? Give us your understanding of what, why the sugar lobby is so so strong and so powerful, and for so many years how they maintain their position. I'm sure you've wrestled with it. It'd be interesting to hear your analysis. Yeah, they they, they raise a lot of money, and they give um, they give equally to Republicans and Democrats. So it's a um, they they cover both they cover both houses. I think what they they've been very effective over the years. They get basically every I'm generalizing here, but this is the only way to do it. They get every farmer, sugar farmer, um, to donate the maximum amount to the, the pack. And they have thousands of people that do that, and it's you know $2,500, and it, it adds up pretty pretty quick. And then they've got super PACs and things like that. It's a very powerful, uh, very powerful lobby. Unfortunately, for the candy industry, you, you know, Spangler is one of the last non-chocolate companies left here in the United States. And even we're part of our, um, you know, toe is in is in Mexico too. But you know, Jolly Ranchers, have you ever had those? They used to be made here in the Midwest. Now they're made in Canada. This is in the last 20 years. This happened. I mean, these are part of the numbers that I put up there. Um, Lifesavers used to be made. I think it was in the Chicago area. I might be wrong. Somewhere in the here in the Midwest, they're now made down in in Mexico. So there's not many people left on the other side of it. 
Um, and, you know, the $50 a year for the consumer, that just flies over people's heads, right? It's not something that voters kind of latch, latch on to. But, uh, but that's why I wanted to let you all know I, that we need to have a voice for, you know, reasonable uh, policies. And, um, yeah, we'll go at them again this time. I do think since inflation is a big issue right now, like, oh, this is, here's one that's obviously inflationary. So if we want to work on that, we, we should. It's probably the last, most other agricultural programs over the years have been, have had some type of reform, and this is due for some type of reform. So thank, thank you all very, very much. See, candy is fun. <laughs> and it's fun when they make money, too. Um, we would like, uh, in appreciation, to present you with a book, oh, Historical you. Tales of Toledo. Awesome. Tells some fun facts about the city, and it was by one of our past presidents, Clint Mock. Excellent. And in addition, we would like to make a donation to the Polio Plus Fund in your name. So, great job. Great I, presentation. I, thank you very thank much. Thank you. And next, I think I have seen Chuck Mann in the room, if he would please come up. Um, and don't forget, no candy can be left on the table. So make sure who's the last one there, get a box if you need it. They don't want to haul this stuff back. That's true. It's true. Looking to the, you ready? Okay. Paul Lind was born in Mount Vernon, Ohio, uh, on June 13, 1926. He was primarily known as the center square on Hollywood Squares. And I really wish I could have brought some of the Hollywood Square stuff, but no, we, uh, we wouldn't be doing that. Uh, but he also appeared as one of the leads in the movie Bye Bye Birdie, and he was famous for his role as Uncle Arthur in the TV show Bewitched. During their off-season, actors used to travel a cross-country circuit of celebrity musicals and comedies. Here in Toledo during the summer of 1978, Paul Lynn starred in a play called The Impossible Years at the Masonic Auditorium. Lynn helped boost ticket sales by promoting his comedic talents. And in this clip, he joins Jennifer Blome on WSPD-TV, Channel 13, to help with the weather. Enjoy this little slice of Toledo television history. For some time, we've got this color weather radar recently, and we still have a problem, so we brought in an expert, Paul Lynn, who has been following weather for some time, I understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love picnics. <laughs> and uh, weather can wipe them out. <laughs> Now, did you want me to start over here? Well, let's start with the satellite map. The, oh, look, the satellite map. Look at this is this first. the satellite map? It's going no, to it come. appears magically. Oh, there okay. It, oh, it looks like trouble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, a heavy fog in New York. Uh, <laughs> or is that London? No, do I go to this now? Yeah. yeah. All right, okay. Uh, well, this is where we're at, isn't it? Right here? Is the H hot or humid? It's both. <laughs> now and there's rain coming down from Canada. Boy, well, and is this New York? Mm. My favorite city in this country. It looks like they're in trouble. <laughs> rain in Maine, rain in is it Massachusetts. Is that it, Jennifer? That's it, that's it. I didn't go to school. <laughs> and sunny. Oh, and Georgia. We're headed for Georgia. And I'm worried really about Texas. I was reading today that they've really had a hot spell there and uh, we're, we're headed, headed to Dallas to and Houston, two of my favorite cities, so cool down. <laughs> and uh, heavy rain headed toward the North Pole. <laughs> and, uh, oh, it's 111 in Nevada, right? There's nothing in, uh, in California. What is that? Uh, low. Low? Low. 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 What does that mean? It means there's bad weather there. Ah, I live right there. No. Right here? What does that mean? Oh, <laughs> what did that mean? <laughs> oh, the next map. All right. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'll pull down your sat. No, <laughs> you told me to tuck that in my pants. All right, we got it. Oh, Cleveland, 75. 
Uh, Toledo, <laughs> which is very important, 79. Today was gorgeous. It really was. I was out by the pool all day. Is this the forecast? No, it's the Oh, tonight. <laughs> Can you see it? <laughs> Clear, mild, low, 55 to 60. That's a nice night. You won't need the air conditioning. And no rain. It's more. Uh oh. <laughs> Tomorrow, sunny, warm, high 82, low 62. Oh, wait a minute. All right. Uh, inland winds tonight, light and variable. Tomorrow, as are we out of time? Uh, tomorrow, uh, boaters forecast. Oh, screw one. Sunrise, 60. It all looks severe weather on Hollywood Square. <laughs> you get the picture? Get some ropes and tie yourself to trees. Thank you once again, Chuck. And thank you all for coming. Um, Thanks for our guests. We had Alex, Corey, Elizabeth, Nora, Braxton, and I didn't catch the name real well, Nina, but it was Katali, something like that. <laughs> anyway, welcome all, and thank you for coming. Uh, next week, we will meet here again on June 13th, and we're going to be joined by Nick Ide, and he will give us an update on the fiberglass tower. Um, in two weeks, we'll be picnicking at the Middle Grounds with the Mesa Bikers. And with that, take your candy. We're adjourned.